The human colony crumpled before the onslaught. Admiral Primus watched with smug satisfaction as his warships effortlessly blasted the human cities to rubble. These primitive primates would be crushed within days, he was certain. It was the year 2257. The Andromedan Empire had launched a surprise invasion of Earth, seeking to enslave the human population and strip the planet of resources. From the bridge of his colossal flagship, Primus observed the initial assault unfold, his face twisted in a sneer. The feeble orbital defences fired frantically but uselessly at the Andromedan ships as they bypassed without difficulty. On the moon base, Colonel Robert Jackson of the Earth Defence Forces could only stare at the viewscreens in shocked horror. Orange blossoms of fire erupted across the night side of Earth as the ruthless bombardment began. Major population centres and military sites were being raised one by one. Cut off from the surface, he and the other EDF soldiers were powerless to intervene. All they could do was watch their homeworld burn. The survivors will make excellent slaves in our tungsten mines, Emperor Primus gloated to his war council, and the resources we seize will fuel our empire's expansion for centuries to come. These humans are pitiful. We'll have this planet fully subjugated within a week. Robert clenched his fists, knuckles white as he surveyed the screens showing city after city being levelled by plasma blasts. The situation seemed hopeless, but he swore to himself and his fellow soldiers that somehow, some way, humanity would find a way fight back against these alien invaders. The alternative, the extinction of the human race, was unthinkable. This could not be how it all ended. The Andromedan ground forces marched into human cities, plasma rifles at the ready. They expected the primitive earthlings to scatter in fear, offering minimal resistance. But as they advanced down debris-strewn streets, the invaders were met with a hail of gunfire and rockets from entrenched human defenders. EDF soldiers and armed civilians fought side by side, taking cover in the ruins of their homes. They set up ambushes, booby traps and sniper nests to maximise their inferior firepower. The Andromedan infantry, used to easy conquests, were caught off guard by the humans' fierce resolve. Despite their advanced armour and weapons, the aliens found themselves bogged down in brutal street-to-street -street fighting. Those damn monkeys don't know when to quit, an Andromedan sergeant snarled as plasma bolts whizzed overhead. His platoon was pinned down by a human machine gun nest in a bombed-out cafe. On his flagship, Admiral Primus slammed a fist on his console in frustration. The tactical display showed his army's advance stalling on all fronts, delayed by pockets of stiff human resistance. I want those holdouts crushed now, he barked at his subordinates. Flatten entire city blocks if you have to, we're behind schedule already. Back on the moon, Colonel Robert Jackson hurried through the corridors of the EDF base, rallying his 500 remaining personnel. They gathered in a cavernous hangar where mining mechs and cargo shuttles were being hastily modified. Technicians welded armor plating onto the hulls, while others mounted railguns and missile pods salvaged from the base's defense turrets. Robert climbed atop a crate addressing the assembled soldiers. I know the odds seem hopeless, but down there on that blue marble, our people are giving the Andromedans hell. They're counting on us. We're going to take the fight to those bastards. The men cheered, raising rifles and tools in the air. Robert looked out a viewport at the Andromedan warships orbiting the moon, transports going back and forth to the surface. His plan was beyond risky. It was borderline suicide. But with no contact from Earth and the base's supplies dwindling, there was no choice. We're going to capture us a ride to Earth and bring some hell of our own, Robert said grimly. Get these ships ready to fly. We attack at 600. For Earth. For Earth, the soldiers roared. They dispersed to their tasks with grim determination, knowing this was humanity's last desperate chance. Robert's heart raced as he piloted the lead makeshift assault craft, little more than a mining shuttle, with a railgun haphazardly welded to its hull. Behind him followed a ragtag fleet of a dozen similar jury-rigged vehicles, each crammed with determined EDF soldiers gripping rifles and demo charges. As they neared the Andromedan warships orbiting the moon, Robert gripped the controls tighter, his eyes locked on their target, 
a bulbous alien troop transport. All units commence attack run, Robert barked into the comm. Shouts of acknowledgement crackled back. The human craft accelerated, thrusters flaring as they bore down on the Andromedan ships. The alien vessels, their crews arrogantly dismissive of the primitive-looking human shuttles, were slow to react. By the time their point defense lasers began swiveling to acquire targets, the EDF ships were already upon them. Robert jinked and weaved, narrowly evading the searing beams. All around him, the void lit up with streaks of tracer fire and missiles as the human craft raked the troop transport with everything they had. Explosions blossomed along the alien ship's hull as the barrage found weak points. Keep hitting them, Robert shouted, lining up his railgun for another run. Slug after hyper-accelerated slug slammed into the transport, breaching its armor. Gouts of atmosphere and debris spewed from the wounds. Colonel, I'm reading major power fluctuations from the target, his sensor officer reported. Their shields are down and engines are offline. We've got them dead in space. Robert allowed himself a tight grin. Breaching pods away. Boarding teams get us a hard seal on that ship. Let's introduce them to some human hospitality. Acknowledgement lights winked on his console as a trio of EDF assault shuttles, little more than repurposed mining pods, latched onto the stricken alien ship like ticks. Cutting torches flared as they burned through the hull. Within minutes, the human soldiers were pouring into the enemy vessel, securing key junctions with practice precision and ruthless efficiency. Robert was right behind them, leaping across the airlock with his rifle up and ready. A pair of Andromedan naval troopers spun to face him, but he dropped them with crisp headshots before they could even raise their weapons. As more EDF soldiers flooded in behind him, Robert grabbed one of the dying aliens by the collar. The bridge! Where is it? he growled. The Andromedan gargled something in its native tongue, a language the humans had yet to fully translate. But the meaning was clear as it weakly pointed a long finger down a corridor. Robert threw the body aside. This way, he called to his men, sweep and clear chamber by chamber, watch the angles. The human soldiers surged forward quickly overwhelming the unprepared Andromedan crew with speed and ferocity. Gunfire and screams echoed through the ship's dark halls. In a matter of minutes, the bridge was taken, the last alien officers subdued in a flurry of rifle butts and shock batons. Robert stormed onto the bridge, his boots tramping through puddles of dark alien blood. Someone get me a translator box now, he snapped. A corporal handed him a battered device, little more than a prototype reverse engineered from captured tech. Holding the translator, Robert stood over a battered Andromedan officer slumped against a bulkhead, his once pristine uniform torn and stained. Why? the human asked simply, his voice cold. Why this invasion? Why Earth? The alien looked up at him with dimming eyes, its breath rattling wetly. At first, Robert thought it wouldn't answer, but then it spoke, its words hissing through the translator. Neutronium. Your system, rich with it. We need our world dying. The Andromedan coughed, dark blood splattering its lips. The asteroid belt. A thousand ships worth... Robert leaned closer, his eyes narrowed. And you couldn't think to trade for it. You had to invade. A rasping, gurgling laugh. Humans, weak, primitives, easy to conquer. The alien's eyes glazed over and its head lolled back. Robert stood, mind racing. This revelation changed everything. He had to get this information back to Earth. Keying his calm, he opened a channel to the EDF remnants. All units, dock your ships and get whatever supplies and intel you can grab from the enemy databases. We're taking this troop transport down to the surface. The resistance needs to hear what we've learned. As his soldiers rushed to carry out his orders, Robert stared out the viewports at the blue-green jewel of Earth hanging below, marred by the angry red glows of Andromedan bombardment. A cold determination filled him. With this new knowledge, they could hit the aliens where it hurt and turn the tide. The neutronium in the asteroid belt was the key both to saving Earth and perhaps giving humanity a bargaining chip to end this war. Admiral Primus slammed his fist on the console, 
the metal crumpling under the force of his blow. The bridge crew flinched, keeping their eyes glued to their stations, lest they draw their commander's ire. "'What do you mean we lost contact with the transport?' Primus snarled at the cowering communications officer. "'How did a handful of primitives overwhelm an entire ship?' Sir, reports indicate they used modified mining equipment to catch the transport by surprise. They disabled its engines and breached the hull. Primus's eyes narrowed, and the crew, the prisoners. The officer swallowed. No word, sir, but the ship, it's gone. Sensors show it entering the atmosphere, under human control. Primus leapt to his feet, his face contorted with rage. Unacceptable! He jabbed a finger at the tactical display, Redeploy all reserve units to the surface now. I want those humans crushed, whatever it takes. Scorched earth, leave nothing standing. As the crew scrambled to relay his orders, Primus stared at the image of the blue planet below, his eyes smouldering. Burn their cities until the very bedrock glows. Let them choke on the ashes of their defiance. On the surface, the resistance faltered as Andromedan reinforcements poured from the skies. Tanks and artillery pounded human positions, the air shimmering with the heat of plasma blasts. The EDF lines buckled, then broke, as the alien onslaught rolled over them like a tide of steel. Amid the chaos, a lone ship slipped through the orbital blockade, skating the edge of the atmosphere. Robert gripped the unfamiliar controls of the Andromedan transport, his face bathed in the glow of warning lights. Come on, hold together he muttered through gritted teeth as the hull groaned around him. The ship shuddered as it knifed through the air, alarms blaring. Behind him, the surviving EDF soldiers clung to whatever handholds they could find, faces grim. With a bone-jarring thud, the ship settled onto a plateau nestled high in the rocky mountains, kicking up a cloud of dust and debris. Robert was the first one down the ramp, rifle clutched tight. He scanned the barren landscape, searching for any sign of life. There, movement among the rocks, a glint of metal. Robert tensed, ready to give the order to open fire, but then a voice called out, a human voice. Hold your fire, friendlies coming out. From hidden crevices and caves, ragged figures emerged, clad in tattered uniforms and civilian clothes. They approached warily, weapons held low but ready. Robert counted at least a hundred, maybe more. The lead figure, a woman with a bandaged eye and a laser rifle slung over her shoulder, stepped forward. I'm Commander Sarah Reese, United States Resistance. Who are you? Robert lowered his own weapon. Colonel Robert Jackson, Earth Defense Force. We've come from the moon base with critical intelligence on the enemy. Reese's eyebrows shot up. The moon? We thought... we thought everyone up there was lost. She shook her head. Never mind that now. You said you have intel? Come with me, there's a lot to catch you up on. As Robert and his team followed Reese into a hidden bunker complex built into the mountainside, he quickly briefed her on what they'd learned from the captured Andromedan officer. Reese listened intently, her face hardening. Neutronium, I should have known. The eggheads always said that stuff would be the key to the next stage of technological advancement. No wonder the squid faces want it so badly. Robert nodded grimly, and they're willing to burn our world for it, but I have a plan. He quickly outlined his idea to strike at the enemy's mining operations, cutting off their supply of the vital resource. Harris considered for a moment, then gave a sharp nod. Bold, risky as hell, but I like it. If we can choke off their neutronium, hit them where they're vulnerable, maybe we have a shot. She turned to a scruffy-looking man hunched over a computer terminal, Hawkins, get me everything we have on the location and defences of those asteroid mines. We've got a new mission. As the resistance fighters sprang into action around them, Robert allowed himself a small, tired smile. It wasn't much, this tiny flicker of hope, but it was something, a chance to strike back, to make the enemy bleed. And he would seize it with both hands for Earth, and for every human life snuffed out in the Andromedans' ruthless advance. The planning session lasted well into the night, huddled around dimly flickering screens and hand-drawn maps. Robert and Reese assembled a small, hand-picked team, the best of the EDF and Resistance, each one ready to lay down their lives for a chance to turn the tide. 
In the pre-dawn gloom, they boarded the captured transport, its hull still scarred from the battle that had delivered it into human hands. Robert took the controls once more, his face set with determination. We'll hit them fast and hard, he said over the comm, his voice steady. In and out before they know what's happening. Plant the charges, grab the data, and get the hell out. Nods and murmurs of assent came from the strike team, each one checking and rechecking their weapons and gear. They all knew the odds, the risks, but they also knew what was at stake. As the ship lifted off, rising on a pillar of fire, Robert cast one last look at the rugged mountains that had sheltered them, the resistance fighters still huddled in their hidden bases. They were the best of humanity, he thought, the stubborn, the defiant, the ones who refused to bend knee to any invader. And he would fight to his last breath to give them a chance, however slim, to see Earth free once more. The Andromedan mining facility hung in the void like a bloated metal spider, its spindly legs anchored to the pitted surface of the asteroid. Swarms of drones buzzed around it, cutting and hauling chunks of raw ore into gaping moors that led to the processing chambers within. Robert guided the transport in slowly, broadcasting stolen codes and trying to keep his breathing steady. Beside him, Reese kept a white-knuckle grip on her rifle, eyes locked on the looming structure. Ugly piece of work, she muttered. Let's hope the codes hold up. I'd hate to come all this way just to get vaporized at the front door. Robert managed a tight smile. You and me both. He released a slow breath as the docking clamps engaged with a shudder, the airlock hissing open, no alarms, no plasma cannons swiveling to atomize them. So far, so good. Stick to the plan, he said, as the strike team assembled in the cargo bay, gear at the ready. Two minutes to plant the charges in the reactor chamber, three to get to the control room and slice the data cores. We'll regroup at the ship and punch out before it all goes up. Reese gave him a fierce grin, slapping a demo charge into her pack. Just another day in the core. Let's give these bastards a wake-up call they won't forget. As the outer airlock door rolled open, Robert gripped his rifle tight and whispered a silent prayer. Then he was moving, boots pounding on the deck plates, the strike team fanning out behind him. Alarms blared, and Andromedan workers scattered as the humans stormed into the heart of the mining facility, weapons spitting fire. Robert led the charge, cutting down the first guards who tried to block their path. Plasma bolts sizzled past his head as he dove for cover behind a bulkhead. Go, go! he roared, laying down suppressing fire as Reese and her team peeled off toward the reactor. More Andromedan security troops poured into the corridor, their shouts echoing off the metal walls. Robert gritted his teeth and pushed forward, his rifle bucking in his hands. They had to buy time, keep the aliens focused on them and away from the charges. A plasma bolt seared across his shoulder, the pain a white-hot lance. He barely felt it, adrenaline surging through his veins, Beside him, a resistance fighter went down, his chest a smoking ruin. Robert leapt over the body, firing from the hip. Control room, where? He snarled at a cowering Andromedan technician. The alien pointed a trembling finger down a side passage. Robert shoved past, his team close behind. The control room was a maze of blinking terminals and hollow displays, the nerve center of the entire facility. Robert brought his rifle to bear as Andromedan officers spun to face him, their eyes wide with shock. Hawkins, get those data cores, Robert barked, spraying the consoles with covering fire. The young tech darted forward, fingers flying over the alien controls. Got it, he crowed, yanking a crystalline data core free in a shower of sparks. Their whole damn database right here. Time to go, Robert keyed his karma to Cerise, status on the charges. Armed and ready, the woman's voice crackled back, laced with static and the chatter of gunfire. Reactor's gonna blow in five minutes. Get your asses back to the ship. Robert took one last look around the control room. Now a shambles of shattered screens and twitching Andromedan bodies. Then he turned and ran, his team pounding behind him. They burst into the docking bay, just as Reese and her demo experts came sprinting from the other direction, their faces streaked with sweat and grime. Robert paused at the airlock, ushering the others through. 
All accounted for, go. He dove through the hatch, slamming his fist on the controls. The airlock sealed with a hiss as the ship disengaged from the station, thrusters flaring. Robert staggered to the bridge, his wounded shoulder throbbing. He collapsed into the pilot's chair, hands flying over the controls. On the viewscreen, the mining facility receded, the asteroid a dark bulk against the stars. Come on, come on, he muttered, coaxing every bit of speed from the straining engines. The seconds ticked down, agonizingly slow. Then soundlessly in the vacuum of space, the asteroid split apart as a blinding white fireball erupted from its core. The mining station vanished in the maelstrom, consumed by the unforgiving nuclear fire. Cheers erupted from the strike team as the shockwave buffeted the ship, alarms blaring. Robert sagged back in his chair, exhaustion and relief washing over him. We did it, he breathed. We actually did it. Reese clapped him on his good shoulder, her grin fierce and exultant. Damn right we did, and we got the intel too. With this data, we can hit the squids where they live. Robert managed a weary nod. It was a victory, hard fought and costly. But the war was far from over. They still had a planet to save, a people to free. But for now, just for this moment, he let himself feel a flicker of hope amidst the darkness. They could do this, they could win. For Earth, for humanity. The fight had only just begun. Robert pored over the stolen Andromedan data, his eyes bloodshot from exhaustion. The plans revealed critical weaknesses in the aliens' ships, vulnerabilities in their life support systems that could be exploited to devastating effect. He shared his findings with Reese and the other resistance leaders, a grim smile on his face. We can hit them where it hurts, he said, jabbing a finger at the hollow display. Sabotage their air filtration units, disrupt their power cores, force them to pull back for repairs. Reese nodded, her expression fierce. We'll need to coordinate strikes across multiple cities. Hit them hard and fast, keep them off balance. Robert turned to Hawkins, the young tech who had proven instrumental in cracking the Andromedan systems. Think you can work your magic on their networks? Sow a little chaos in their ranks? Hawkins grinned, cracking his knuckles. I've been itching to get my hands on their code. Give me a few hours and I'll have them chasing ghost signals and firing on their own ships. As the resistance set to work, a flurry of activity filled the bunker. Strike teams armed themselves and prepped for missions, while hackers hunched over terminals, lines of alien script scrolling across their screens. Robert felt a surge of pride as he watched them work these brave men and women fighting with everything they had against impossible odds. The raids began at dawn, resistance fighters striking with precision and fury. In New York, a team infiltrated an Andromedan landing craft, planting explosives that ripped through its life support systems in a gout of flame. In London, saboteurs breached the cooling tanks of a massive alien transport, leaving it dead in the water, venting atmosphere. Across the globe, the story was the same, human ingenuity and determination against Andromedan might. And slowly, painfully, the tide began to turn. Alien ships limped back into orbit, their hulls scorched and pitted. Confusion reigned in their ranks as communications broke down, orders contradicted each other, and friendly fire incidents multiplied. In his command ship, Primus slammed his fist against the console, his face contorted with rage. The reports flowed in, each one a fresh blow to his pride. A dozen ships crippled by sabotage. Communications in chaos. Assault teams ambushed and slaughtered by human vermin. Unacceptable, he roared, rounding on his cowering subordinates. I want every one of those primitives hunted down and exterminated. No mercy, no quarter. But even as he ranted and raved, Doubt gnawed at the edges of Primus's mind. He had dismissed the humans as weak, insignificant. But now they were striking at the very heart of his forces, exploiting vulnerabilities he had never even considered. Could it be that he had underestimated them, that this conquest would not be the easy victory he had imagined? So he pushed the thought aside, his eyes blazing with manic fervor. He was Primus warlord of the Andromedan Empire, he would not be defeated by the likes of these savages. He would crush them, grind them to dust beneath his boots. 
and if he had to burn their cities to ash and choke their skies with the corpses of their people to do it, so be it. The Andromedan fleet would not rest until the last human breath was stilled, and Earth was firmly under the heel of its new masters. Robert pored over the intelligence reports, his brow furrowed with concentration. The past few weeks had been a whirlwind of daring raids and narrow escapes, striking at the Andromedans wherever they could. But it was taking a toll, supplies were running low, and the human resistance was stretched thin. We can't keep this up forever, Reese said, her voice weary as she slumped into a chair beside him. We're hitting them hard, but they just keep coming. Robert nodded, his jaw set. We need a game-changer, something to really knock them back on their heels. As if in answer, Hawkins burst into the room, his eyes alight with excitement. I think I've got something, he said, brandishing a data pad. Intercepted Andromedan communique. Looks like their big boss, Primus himself, is going to be visiting their main base outside D.C. Robert sat up straight, his exhaustion forgotten. Primus, you're sure? Hawkins nodded. Seems he's not happy with how things are going. Wants to give a big speech, boost morale, oversee some key supply shipments. A slow smile spread across Robert's face. This is it. This is our chance. He turned to Reese, his mind racing. If we can get to Primus, take him out or capture him, it could throw their whole command structure into chaos. Reese's eyes gleamed. It's risky as hell, that base will be heavily guarded. No riskier than staying on the defensive and waiting for them to grind us down, Robert countered. This is the opening we've been waiting for. We've got to take it. The next few hours passed in a blur of frantic planning and preparation. Robert handpicked a small team of their best fighters, battle-hardened EDF soldiers and resistance veterans, each one ready to lay down their lives for a shot at Primus. As they geared up checking weapons and running through the plan one last time, Robert felt a sense of grim determination settle over him. This was it, the pivotal moment, the chance to strike a blow that could change the course of the war. They slipped out into the night, moving silently through the rubble-strewn streets. The Andromedan base loomed ahead, a stark metal fortress bristling with defences. Searchlights swept the perimeter, and the low hum of energy barriers filled the air. Robert signalled his team and they split into two groups. One would create a diversion, drawing the guard's attention, while the other slipped inside to find Primus. The diversion came first, a series of explosions ripping through the base's outer defences, sending Andromedan soldiers scrambling. Robert and his infiltration team moved quickly, darting through the shadows and into the base's maze-like interior. They encountered resistance almost immediately. Andromedan guards pouring into the corridors with weapons drawn. The humans fought with desperate ferocity, trading shots and engaging in brutal close-quarters combat. Robert found himself grappling with a hulking Andromedan soldier, the alien's strength nearly overwhelming. He managed to twist free, snapping the creature's neck with a savage jerk. There was no time for finesse, no room for mercy. They pushed deeper into the base, following the schematics Hawkins had pulled from the intelligence reports. If Primus was here, he would be in the command center, a fortified room at the heart of the facility. As they neared their target, the resistance grew fiercer. Andromedan guards seemed to materialize from every shadow, their weapons spitting deadly plasma. Robert's team fought for every inch, leaving a trail of broken alien bodies in their wake. Finally, they reached the command center doors, Massive slabs of reinforced metal bristling with security systems. Robert nodded to Hawkins, who set to work, his fingers flying over a hacking device. The doors slid open with a hiss and Robert charged inside, rifle at the ready. And there, standing amid a bank of glowing screens and control panels, was Primus himself. The Andromedan leader was tall and imposing. His angular features twisted into a sneer of disdain. Humans, he spat, his voice dripping with contempt. You dare to challenge me? Robert raised his weapon, his eyes hard. It's over, Primus, surrender, and you might just survive this. Primus laughed, a harsh, grating sound. 
Surrender? To primitives like you? I think not. His hand darted to his belt, and suddenly he was armed, a wicked-looking plasma blade humming to life in his grip. Robert barely had time to react as Primus lunged, the blade sizzling through the air. He managed to parry the blow with his rifle, the force of the impact sending shockwaves up his arms. The two leaders clashed in a furious dance of strike and counter-strike, plasma blade against rifle butt, each seeking an opening. Primus was fast, his movements fluid and precise, but Robert matched him step for step, driven by grim determination. Around them, the command center dissolved into chaos as the rest of Robert's team engaged the Andromedan guards. Plasma bolts flew, consoles exploded in showers of sparks, and bodies hit the floor. Robert pressed his attack, driving Primus back with a relentless flurry of blows. The Andromedan snarled, his composure slipping, and for a moment Robert saw a flicker of fear in those alien eyes. With a final desperate lunge, Robert closed the distance and struck, his rifle butt slamming into Primus's temple with sickening force. The Andromedan leader crumpled, his plasma blade clattering to the floor. Robert stood over his fallen foe, chest heaving, as the last of the guards were dispatched. It was over. Against all odds, they had done it. Get him secured, Robert ordered, gesturing to Primus's unconscious form. And someone find me a comlink. It's time to let the rest of the Andromedan bastards know their boss is now our guest. As his team set to work, Robert allowed himself a moment of grim satisfaction. Primus's capture would send shockwaves through the Andromedan ranks, sowing fear and uncertainty. It was a turning point, a chance to seize the initiative and push back against the invaders. The road ahead would be long and hard, Robert knew. The Andromedans were still a formidable foe, even without their leader. But for the first time since the invasion began, he dared to hope. They had struck a blow today, shown the aliens that humanity would not go quietly into the night. And with Primus as their prisoner, they finally had a bargaining chip, a chance to negotiate from a position of strength. It was a new phase of the war, and Robert intended to make the most of it. He looked around at his battered but triumphant team, pride swelling in his chest. They had done the impossible today, and they would do it again as many times as it took. For Earth, for humanity. The fight was far from over, but they would meet it head-on, united and unyielding, and in the end, against all odds, they would prevail. In the aftermath of Primus's capture, the Andromedan command structure fractured. Rival commanders, each seeking to fill the power vacuum left by their leader's absence, vied for control of the remaining forces. The once unified alien army splintered into competing factions, their focus shifting from the conquest of Earth to internal power struggles. Robert and the Resistance wasted no time in seizing this opportunity. They launched a series of coordinated strikes against key Andromedan positions worldwide. Teams of saboteurs hit supply depots and communication hubs, while EDF soldiers and armed civilians assaulted the aliens' fortified strongholds. In the ruins of Los Angeles, a resistance cell led by a grizzled former Marine infiltrated an Andromedan motor pool. They planted explosives on the aliens' armored vehicles and hoverbikes, turning the depot into a raging inferno. Similar scenes played out in cities across the globe as the human resistance tightened the noose around the invaders. Robert and his team also began a campaign of psychological warfare. They hacked into the Andromedans' communication frequencies, broadcasting messages revealing the truth about the aliens' desperate need for neutronium. Your leaders have lied to you, Robert's voice echoed through the Andromedan ranks. This war was never about conquest or glory. It was about survival. Your empire is crumbling, your home world is dying. But it doesn't have to end in bloodshed. Lay down your arms, and we can work together to find a peaceful solution. Some Andromedan units, their faith in their mission shaken by Primus's defeat and the revelations about their empire's true motives, began to waver. A few even surrendered outright, laying down their weapons and seeking asylum among the humans they had once fought. Others simply deserted, vanishing into the wilderness, unwilling to continue fighting for a cause they no longer believed in. 
As the resistance gained ground and the Andromedan position weakened, an unexpected development occurred. Robert received an encrypted message from a mysterious figure calling themselves the Sentinel. The message claimed that the Sentinel represented a faction within Andromedan society that opposed the war and Primus's tyrannical rule. We have watched your struggle with great interest, the Sentinel's message read. Your resilience and determination have shown us that a different path is possible. We are prepared to offer you our support, intelligence, resources, even ships and weapons. In return, we ask only for your guarantee of safety and asylum for our supporters when the war is over. Robert leaned back in his chair, his mind racing. An alliance with a rebel Andromedan faction could tip the scales decisively in their favour. But could he trust this sentinel? Was it a genuine offer of aid, or a trap designed to lure the resistance into letting down its guard? He shared the message with his closest advisers, Reese, Hawkins, and a few others who had proven their loyalty and judgment. They debated long into the night, weighing the risks and potential rewards. It could be a game-changer, Reese argued. Imagine having Andromedan ships fighting on our side, Andromedan intel on their own weaknesses. Or it could be a disaster, Hawkins countered. What if it's a trick? What if we let them in and they stab us in the back? In the end, Robert made the call. They would accept the Sentinel's offer, but with caution. They would meet with this mysterious ally, hear what they had to say, but they would also be ready for any sign of betrayal. He sent a reply to the Sentinel, agreeing to their terms. He proposed a meeting at a neutral site of his choosing, where they could discuss the details of their alliance face to face. As he hit send, Robert felt a mix of hope and trepidation. The war had taken a turn he could never have predicted. But then, nothing about this fight had gone according to plan. They had adapted, improvised, and overcome every obstacle the Andromedans had thrown at them. This would be no different. He looked out the window of his makeshift command center, at the battered but unbroken city beyond. Humanity had come so far, endured so much. They were on the brink now. He could feel it. One way or another, the end was coming. And with this new alliance, perhaps, just perhaps it would be an end in their favor. Robert sat in his makeshift command center, staring at the encrypted message on his screen. The Sentinel's offer was tempting. Critical intelligence and support from within the Andromedan ranks could change everything. But trust was a precious commodity in this war, and he couldn't afford to spend it recklessly. He called in his most trusted lieutenants, Reese, Hawkins, and a handful of others, who had proven their mettle time and again. They pored over the message, debating the risks and potential rewards. There could be a trap, Hawkins said, his brow furrowed. They could be trying to lure us out, get us to lower our guard. Reese shook her head. I don't think so. Look at the intel they're offering, details on Andromedan troop movements, supply lines, even the location of a secret research facility. That's not the kind of thing you share if you're setting a trap. Robert listened to the arguments, weighing each point carefully. In the end, he made the call. We'll work with this sentinel, but we'll be cautious. We verify every piece of intel they give us, and we keep our eyes open for any sign of betrayal. He sent a reply to the sentinel, agreeing to the alliance. In the days that followed, a stream of information began to flow between the resistance and their new Andromedan allies. Troop deployments, supply schedules, even schematics of new weapons. Each nugget of intelligence was carefully analysed and cross-checked. One piece of information stood out among the rest. The Sentinel revealed the existence of a hidden Andromedan research facility deep in the Sahara Desert. According to the intel, scientists there were working on a terrifying new weapon, a device designed to strip Earth's atmosphere of oxygen, rendering the planet uninhabitable for humans. Robert knew they had to act fast. He assembled a strike team, his best fighters along with a group of Andromedan soldiers who had defected to join the Sentinel's cause. They pored over satellite imagery and intercepted communications, piecing together a plan of attack. The journey to the Sahara was tense and silent, the hum of the transport's engines the only sound. Robert checked and rechecked his weapon, 
his mind running through the plan again and again. As they neared the facility, they could see it shimmering in the desert heat, a sprawling complex of gleaming metal and glass surrounded by a bristling perimeter of defences. Robert gave the signal, and the transport swooped low, skimming over the dunes. The moment they touched down, all hell broke loose. Alarms blared and plasma bolts filled the air as the facility's defenders rushed to respond. Robert and his team charged forward, taking cover behind sand-scoured walls and returning fire. The battle was fierce and bloody, each side fighting with desperate intensity. Robert saw several of his men go down, their bodies sprawled in the sand, but they pushed forward, inch by hard-fought inch, until they breached the facility's outer defences. Inside, the fighting grew even more brutal. The narrow corridors and cramped laboratories became a labyrinth of close-quarters combat, with plasma rifles and vibroblades clashing in desperate melees. Robert and his team fought their way to the heart of the complex, where they found the weapon, a sinister-looking device pulsing with malevolent energy. They set to work, planting explosives and downloading research data, all while fending off wave after wave of Andromedan defenders. As they fought, Robert caught glimpses of the facility's dark secrets, holding cells filled with emaciated human prisoners, examination rooms where Andromedan scientists pored over grisly biological samples. He realized with a surge of anger that the aliens had been experimenting on captured humans, trying to unlock the secrets of their resilience and adaptability. With the weapons secured and the research data wiped, Robert gave the order to withdraw. They fought their way back out of the facility, dodging plasma bolts and collapsing rubble. As they boarded their transport and lifted off, Robert looked back at the burning ruins of the complex, his mind racing. The raid had been a success, but it had also revealed a chilling truth. The Andromedans were more than just invaders. They were trying to understand and exploit the very essence of humanity. Robert knew that the key to ending this war might lie in grasping the fundamental differences between their species, in finding a way to bridge the gap that separated them. As the transport streaked away over the dunes, Robert clenched his fist, a grim resolve settling over him. They had won a battle today, but the war was far from over, and if they were going to triumph, they would need to fight not just with weapons, but with understanding. Robert sat in the makeshift conference room, his heart pounding as he waited for the Andromedan delegation to arrive. The room was a far cry from the polished diplomatic chambers he'd seen in old movies, just a battered table and a handful of mismatched chairs hastily set up in an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of the city. But it would have to do. After all, there was no precedent for this, no protocol to follow. They were making history here, for better or worse. He glanced around at the others in the room, a handful of key resistance leaders, all looking as nervous as he felt. They'd fought side by side for months, but this was uncharted territory for all of them, negotiating with the enemy, trying to find common ground with the very beings who had invaded their world and slaughtered their people. It went against every instinct they had. The door opened, and the sentinel entered, flanked by a small group of Andromedan soldiers. Robert tensed, his hand instinctively going to his weapon, but he forced himself to relax. This was a diplomatic meeting, not a battle. The sentinel, an imposing figure with piercing blue eyes and a jagged scar across his face, took a seat across from Robert. Thank you for agreeing to this meeting, he said, his voice a guttural rasp. I know it can't be easy, after all that has happened. Robert nodded, choosing his words carefully. No, it's not easy, but I think we all know that this war has to end one way or another, and if there's a chance for a peaceful resolution, we have to take it. He leaned forward, his gaze intense. But first I need to know something. When we raided that research facility in the Sahara, we found evidence that your people had been experimenting on humans, trying to understand what makes us tick, what gives us our strength and resilience. Why, what were you hoping to gain? The sentinel was silent for a long moment. When he spoke, his voice was heavy with regret. It was Primus's obsession, he said. He believed that unlocking the secrets of your biology could give us an edge in the war. 
that if we could harness your adaptability, your tenacity, we could become invincible. He shook his head. But he was wrong. All it did was make us more like the monsters we claim to be fighting against, and it blinded us to the truth that we have more in common than we realized. Robert sat back considering this. How so? he asked. We're both fighting for survival, the Sentinel said, for our homes, our families, our way of life. Your people are fighting to protect Earth, just as we are fighting to save our own world. He leaned forward, his eyes intense. Our homeworld is dying, he said. Our supplies of neutronium, the mineral that powers our technology and sustains our civilization, are almost gone. That's why we came to Earth, not to conquer, but to survive. Robert felt a flicker of understanding, even empathy. He thought of the desperation he'd seen in the eyes of his own people, the lengths they'd gone to in order to protect what was theirs. Was it so different from what had driven the Andromedans to invade? But there are many among my people who oppose the war, the Sentinel continued, who believe that there must be another way, a path that doesn't lead to more bloodshed and destruction. Primus silenced us, branded us as traitors and cowards, but with him gone, we have a chance to make our voices heard. Robert nodded slowly. And what do those voices say? he asked. That we must find a way to share the resources of this system, the Sentinel replied, to work together, humans and Andromedans, to ensure that both our worlds can thrive. It won't be easy, and there will be much to work through, but the alternative is to keep fighting until there's nothing left to fight for. He extended a hand across the table, a simple gesture loaded with meaning. I'm asking for a chance, he said, a chance to prove that we can be more than enemies, that we can build a future together instead of tearing each other apart. Robert hesitated for a long moment, the weight of the decision heavy on his shoulders. Then, slowly, he reached out and grasped the sentinel's hand. It was cool to the touch, the skin rough and textured, but it felt like a lifeline, a fragile bridge across the yawning chasm that divided their two species. All right, he said, let's talk. As the two sides began to discuss the details of a ceasefire, and the framework for future negotiations, Robert felt a glimmer of hope amid the uncertainty and fear. There was still a long road ahead, and many wounds to heal on both sides, but for the first time since the war began, he dared to believe that peace was possible, that out of the ashes of this conflict, something new and better could grow. It wouldn't be easy. There would be setbacks and stumbling blocks, moments when the old hatred and mistrust threatened to resurface, but they had to try, for the sake of their people, for the future they could build together. One step at a time, one day at a time, they would find a way forward, and maybe, just maybe, they would look back on this moment as the turning point, the moment when two worlds, once bitter enemies, began to forge a new path, a path that led not to war, but to understanding, cooperation, and even friendship. The atmosphere in the summit room was electric with tension and possibility. Robert could feel the weight of history pressing down on them all. The Sentinel spoke with quiet intensity, outlining the terms of the proposed ceasefire. It was a fraught negotiation, with both sides having to make painful concessions, but slowly, painfully, they inched towards a deal. Robert was just about to add his signature to the agreement when the doors burst open. Andromedan soldiers poured into the room, weapons drawn. At their head was Zyrax, Primus's second in command. His eyes blazed with zealous fury. Traitors, Zyrax bellowed. You would betray our species, our destiny for these primitives. The sentinel stepped forward, hands raised in a placating gesture. Zyrax, stand down, this war is over. We have a chance for peace, for a future. Zyrax sneered. Peace with these savages never! He turned to his soldiers. Kill them all! Chaos erupted. Plasma bolts filled the air as the Andromedans opened fire. The Sentinel pushed Robert down, shielding him with his body. Around them, humans and Andromedans alike fell, the hope of just moments before drowned in blood. Robert crawled to the Sentinel's side, frantically checking for a pulse. But it was too late. The Sentinel was gone, 
the life fading from his eyes, even as his blood stained Robert's hands. Grief and rage welled up inside Robert, a searing knot in his chest. He looked around at the carnage, the shattered remnants of their fragile peace. No, he would not let it end like this. He would not let the sentinel's sacrifice be in vain. He staggered to his feet, his voice rising above the din of battle. To me, he cried, to me all who would see this world free. And they came, humans and Andromedans united by the dream of peace that Xyrax had tried to destroy. They rallied around Robert, ready for one last fight. The battle that followed was brutal and bloody, a desperate struggle for the very soul of two species. Xyrax's loyalists fought with the ferocity of true believers, convinced of their own righteousness. But Robert and his allies had something more. They had hope, and the determination to see it realized. In the end, it was enough. The loyalists were defeated, their hold on earth broken. As the last Andromedan ships fled into the sky, Robert stood amidst the ruins, his heart heavy with the price of victory. He thought of the sentinel of the courage and vision he had shown in reaching out to his former enemies. He thought of the future they had dreamed of, a future now left to Robert to build. The sun rose over the shattered city, the dawn light casting a warm glow over the rubble and ruin. Robert squared his shoulders, ready to face the challenges ahead. It would not be easy. The wounds of the war ran deep, and trust would not come quickly. But he would not give up. For the sentinel, for all those who had given their lives, he would see this through, towards peace, towards understanding, towards a future where their two peoples could stand as one. You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.